All right, Bismillah, and we are live. Assalamu alaikum to the ladies who are here with us live, and then the ladies who are going to be joining in a bit, inshallah, and all of those who are watching the recording. I'm super excited about this month's monthly expert interview in our digital community. Um, so this month, I'm going to read the bio that was provided. It's actually in first person. <laughs> So I I'm gonna, can, I, mean, I have it in front of me. I can read it if you'd like. <laughs> go for it, inshallah. Please introduce yourself and, and just tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, perfect. So my name is Noor, and I would say that I am an expert on my own life, um, but it's really <laughs> such an honor to be invited into this space. And I was gentle parented as a child, um, which might seem as a surprise since I, you know, I come from an immigrant family. My family is Egyptian and they moved to the US. Um, and I grew up really feeling loved and respected and in a safe household. Um, but at 22, unfortunately, through the core life crisis, you know, lost my spark for a little bit and was really confused as to why my inner world changed so much. Um, but having a master's in Montessori education and knowing about child development and knowing everything basically that I know about emotional regulation but not being able to implement it on myself, I knew that I needed to do something. I knew that I had the tools to do it, but I just couldn't figure out how to implement it yet. So I decided to basically experiment with all of my Montessori training that I had over the course of six years. Um, and I used what I knew about child development, social emotional learning and mindfulness to create a little program for myself. The inner peace that I found from this program was truly, truly amazing. And so I've been sharing it on social media ever since. And it's really become my passion to share the things that I've been trained to teach children and then to take that and share it with adults. So over the past six months, or maybe it's been seven or eight months now, I've lost track. But since the beginning of this year, um, I've created two digital guides called the Kindness Book and the Mindfulness Boot Camp to basically teach other adults the skills that they need to find their own inner peace. And I'm so excited to be here and talk with you guys, inshallah, and hear any questions you might have about mindfulness or my journey. Inshallah. So the first part of it, inshallah, will be just me and you um, speaking, and then other questions that come up will be at the end. So first of all, <laughs> the fact that you were gentle parented as an Arab child is it's shocking across the board. I mean, that's literally how you went viral. I remember when I first came across your video, it was like, I'm an immigrant child who was <laughs> gentle parented. And I was like, huh? What? <laughs> And then yeah. you, you know, continue. Con the funny thing is, you crack the social media algorithm because the algorithm loves controversy, essentially. Yeah. And it's actually incredibly sad to think that gentle, being gentle parented, is a controversial thing. But that's the unfortunate reality, right? So I'm curious to know before we even jump into it, what is, what is Montessori training or uh, schooling for those who who might not be familiar? Yes. Yeah, so first of all, Montessori is uh, basically teaching philosophy that was created by Maria Montessori in Italy. And she started off, she was a physician, actually, who was observing children who had ADHD, who had autism, who were considered neurodivergent and didn't really have the tools that they needed at the time. And she observed them and saw that they were so understimulated that they were basically lashing out and having all of these behavioral issues because no adult around them was meeting their needs. And so as a physician, and through her observations, she started experimenting, okay, if I give them these tools, and if I can teach them the material in this way, will they be able to learn? If I meet their needs in this specific way, will the behavioral issues stop? And if they can't communicate their needs to me verbally because of whatever issues they have or lack of education that they've received, um, how can I learn from them, right? How does their behavior communicate to me? What are other nonverbal ways that children might be communicating their needs to me? And so basically through all of that observation and experimentation, she created this pedagogy where basically teaching educators how to see children for their needs and how to see behavior as a form of communication. Once you see mm -hmm. children's behavior as a form of communication, you start to depersonalize a lot of things. I think a lot of people are triggered by children because they just don't understand them. And it's like, why are you, like, if you're hungry, why are you screaming in my face and hitting me, right? Let's like, just say you're hungry. But 
when you learn that behavior is just a form of communication, then you really start to detach yourself from the behavior of the child. And you as a teacher start to transform and see that, okay, just because a child is doing something doesn't mean it's a reflection of my ability. Just because a child is screaming at me doesn't mean I have to scream in return. Just because my child is crying doesn't mean that I'm a failure as a parent, right? They're just trying to communicate something with me and I can give them the tools to communicate that differently in the future. And so that's kind of a nutshell of um, what I've learned through Montessori. <laughs> Got it, got it. And subhanAllah, the the idea that communication is behavior is something that no you're not learning, right? And it's such a it's so counter the, to the typical way of educating and schooling children, which is very dehumanizing. There's a lot of almost like we call it a school to prison pipeline for a reason in the United States. I don't know. Are you in Canada or US? I'm in the US. Okay. So these, you know, the idea that we're we're essentially just teaching children how to fall in line and expecting very adult behavior out of little kids. Um, mm -hmm. And I have a different theory as to why children trigger adults so much. And I think it's because it more so triggers their inner child wounds for a lot okay. of, yeah, for a lot of adults. The, I don't know how to meet the needs of this child because I never got my needs met as a child. And how do you how do you do something that you never learned? So we can understand why something like gen kind of, I guess, gentle parenting, Montessori type techniques, compassionate, you know, uh, interaction with children works for children. But why is it important for adults? It's so, so important for adults, because like you said, how are you going to ever give a child what you yourself don't know how to give? right? So I always say, how are you going to teach a child emotional regulation if you get triggered by their big emotions? How are you going to teach a child boundaries if you yourself don't know how to hold up boundaries in relationships? It's like trying to teach physics when you've never studied physics, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so really realizing that children are mirrors of how we show up in our life. And if we show up unkind, if we show up harsh on ourselves, if we show up very stressed and very overwhelmed, that's that's what how our kids are going to show up as well. They are going to show up unkind to themselves. They are going to show up very harsh on themselves and critical of themselves. And so understanding that it starts with the parent. It always starts with the parent or the teacher in my case. Mm, or the, the adult in the room. The... Um, when you talk about kindness, right, it can come across, some people might hear it and they'll be like, it comes across, this is so fluffy. What does it mean to be kind to yourself, right? We think like whimsical fairies and like rainbows and sparkles, right? But for those who follow you on social media, it's actually a very practical kind of, uh, you have a very practical way of discussing kindness. So can you give examples of when you say, people are being unkind to themselves, what does that look like? And when people are being kind to themselves instead, what does that look like? Yeah, so I think a lot of people um, conflate kindness with positivity. And mm -hmm. I wanna make it very clear that kindness is not the same thing as being positive, right? Speaking to yourself kindly does not mean saying positive things all the time. Mm -hmm. Speaking to yourself kindly means speaking to yourself with respect you are choosing respectful language to communicate with yourself. So you can be sad respectfully, you can be angry respectfully, which is pretty different from positivity because when you're thinking of always being positive and always being happy and always being optimistic, that can be actually another form of just suppressing uncomfortable feelings and suppressing uncomfortable emotions. Mm -hmm. So when we remove that positivity aspect and focus on respect, we really see that distinction clearer and see how, yes, I can be frustrated and still be kind to myself. I can be jealous of someone or I can experience these like really intense emotions and still be kind to myself. I can fail and acknowledge my failure and still be kind to myself. So it really creates that world of and. And some examples of being unkind are saying things like, why am I even here? Like I'm so underqualified to be here or oh my goodness, I'm so lazy. I can't believe I haven't folded the laundry yet. It's been three days or those dishes are so disgusting. I cannot keep on top, like I can never stay on top of my chores. Why am I like this? All of those things are 
disrespectful ways of speaking to yourself, even though I think it's very common to say, oh, I'm lazy, oh, I'm a failure, oh, why am I here? I think it's, it's something that everyone goes through. But once you notice that thought, how can you take that same message and just change the words to be more respectful? So for example, for the imposter syndrome one, oh my goodness, why am I here? I'm so underqualified. I feel unprepared for this stage, or I feel unprepared to be in this Is there anything I can learn from? Right. So I'm still acknowledging the feeling of like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm kind of scared to be here. But I'm not being rude to myself and I'm not kind of limiting my capabilities and just staying stuck in the underqualified version of myself. <laughs> I'm asking myself, who can I learn from? Is there anyone that I can take as a mentor? Um, yeah, I, I do feel underqualified, but I'm so lucky to be in the space where everyone around me has a few more years of experience and I can really, you know, use this as a learning opportunity. Um, for the example of, oh, I didn't put my laundry away or I can never keep up with my chores, I'm so lazy. Um, you can acknowledge, like, I'm feeling super overwhelmed right now and it's actually very difficult for me to stay on top of my chores. What is a priority for me or what will make my space more functional? So again, acknowledging that feeling, like I really cannot stay on top of all of this. Um, I might need more support, but in the meantime, what do I need done right now? What is going to be the most helpful for me to do right now? And so at the end of the day, moral of the story, kindness is respect. And when you choose kindness, it is not fluff. It creates that beautiful world of and. I'm experiencing uncomfortable emotions and. How can I help myself? How am I going to get through this? All of those beautiful things. <laughs> beautiful. And as a trauma coach, one, this is kind of a, a one part of the overarching theory that I use to support my clients, which is there, it's so important to come to those emotions and those reactions and those automatic negative thoughts that come up with such self-compassion and curiosity. Because, and, and, and I'm sure you'll agree with this, every emotional response, every even physiological response, the tension you feel in your shoulders, the the shakiness in your voice in a certain situation, all of that is a response that serves a purpose and when we're curious about the purpose that it's serving instead of judging it for what it is then we're able to acknowledge hey this might not be the best way to achieve the purpose that i'm trying to achieve as an example the tension might be a means of it's our nervous system bracing ourselves right for some sort of attack uh, or we felt unsafe for so long so the nervous system is bracing itself but coming to that with curiosity okay well is this actually functional in my life? Is this actually serving my best interest? And if not, we can go back and reverse engineer that, right? And obviously when it comes to trauma specifically, it's a lot more complicated than that. I always tell my clients, and I'll, I'll say this across my contact, you can't think your way out of trauma. You can't, like, you can't think and feel your way out of trauma. There's a lot of work that has to happen in order to actively heal trauma because this is something that's often overlooked in the the social media world when it comes to a lot of trauma experts even trauma therapists right this idea I, i'll come across so many individuals who've worked with therapists who um said you know claim that they were trauma informed or are trained to work with complex ptsd or depression anxiety disorders that are related to trauma and yet the order in which they're doing it is actually re-traumatizing to their clients subhanallah so one question that i do have and as someone who i hmm, how do i describe myself if, if anyone here works with me they'll, 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 they'll i think they'll agree i think i like a a, a large dose of reality in like I like I, I like a big bowl of reality stew. So something of like, damn, I'm I'm underqualified. It doesn't hurt me to say that when I say that to myself. And perhaps it's it's because of the framing in my mind of like when I see something of that sort, I think, oh, I'm underqualified. So what am I gonna do to ensure that I'm qualified? Or what are the gaps that are coming in? So I'm curious to know for someone who like me, or and this I think is actually a response of a lot of individuals who have healed from trauma. Um, who kind of come to it with a, this is what it is, but I don't like it, so I'm going to do something about it. How do we ensure that we're not accidentally moving into like a pattern of negativity or or losing that kindness while we're while we're maintaining a very like stern way about going uh, uh, stern way of going about things? 
Yeah, that's a great question because I think me personally, I was also one of those people who was like, I'm just going to say it how it is, even if it sounds really um, mm -hmm. negative or if it sounds like I, I could be more optimistic and hopeful, but really I don't want to lead myself into that path. I think the the best way to go about that is to separate, and this is a lot harder said than done, right? But to essentially separate your self-worth from the outcome. And this is something that my family has taught me, is that regardless of the outcome that happens, like for example, in the example of being underqualified, even if I stay underqualified forever <laughs> in comparison to the people around me, mm -hmm. that does not affect my self-worth. Mm -hmm. Even if I do end up being more qualified than the people around me, that does not change my self-worth. And so essentially, regardless of the outcome that happens, as long as I am staying true to my input and putting in the work that I see is necessary for me, having the mindset that I think works best for me, treating myself with respect and treating others with respect and making sure that, yes, these are you know, uncomfortable feelings and it's an uncomfortable space to be in, but I'm still choosing respect. All of that is my input. Mm -hmm. Regardless of what happens, I, I my self-worth does not change. Mm -hmm. This is super interesting. First of all, I'm, I'm curious. You, what, girl, you got to get your mama on an interview because the way you've got <laughs> one, I'm sure people are begging, like, bring this woman on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's because the, the question then becomes that I, that I have, so I have two questions. One is in regards to your mom. Where did your mom learn this stuff? From my grandma. So Where did your grandma, somebody had to break a cycle. I know. Somebody, because there's no way from the beginning of Adam until then the all of y'all were just these positive, like healthy parents yeah. who knew what they were doing. So it's, it's just a reminder, subhanAllah, of how necessary the work we do around our healing is because at some point that we change the dynamic yeah. and then that becomes the norm. That new loving, self-compassionate, caring way about building our family becomes the norm, subhanAllah. So that's one just one day, one day we got to meet that woman, mashallah, tabarakallah. Um, another thing that I just really appreciate about the self-worth thing is, and this is something, again, with my clients we talk, we talk about, which is... When it comes to the work that we do, the, the efforts we put in are on us. The outcome is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And mm -hmm. this goes counter to a lot of, I have actually a video coming up soon on you uh, on my YouTube channel regarding manifestation and some of the very victim blaming like tendencies that manifest teaching manifestation has, including the law, the law of attraction, in my opinion, this idea that like, you know, you attract into your life what the negative experiences that you have. And it's like, but also no because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us he's going to test us with negative experiences he's gonna right the, the quran describes that you may be tested with poverty you may be just tested with with um death death of those around you with fear i can't remember the exact wording of the verse and our 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 deen right we try to do frame everything with um with islam in mind is one that prepares us to not to not base our self-worth and who we are on this dunya, including the circumstances of dunya, mm -hmm. and rather to root that self worth in our relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, in the taqwa we have to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, because that's that's a never and that's an infinite like stream of uh, love and mercy and you know khayr and it's just something that we 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 tend to overlook, especially with a lot of the messaging around self improvement um, on social media being peddled by muslims and non-muslims so yeah when, that's really yeah. true and i think my family as well you know i'm very used to talking to like a non-muslim audience so when i explain these things like i don't always mention the islamic background but that is how my mom taught it to me that mm -hmm. at the end of the day like whatever happens the output is in allah's hands mm -hmm. what's in your hands is your input and allah says that he is judging you on your actions and on your name on your intentions right Mm -hmm. The outcome of those actions are not necessarily in your control, right? And they do not ever affect your self-worth and the way that Allah created you. Mm -hmm. And even just that, subhanAllah, that's another example of kindness, right? Because we don't place on ourselves burdens that, that are not ours to carry. 
And a lot of, so anxiety, anxiety is a symptom. You guys will hear me all the time, right? We distinguish between anxiety and depression as symptoms, not conditions. They are symptoms of conditions, depending on how long they go on. My background is in medicine. Nude. I don't know if you, you know this. And I've studied psychiatry and treated psychiatric patients. So this is a really important distinction, um, depending on certain symptoms that are present and the length of time in which they're present. And that's what determines whether a disorder is, is, is actually, um, can be diagnosed. But in, it, there's so much anxiety that people carry surrounding the outcomes that they can't control. And that when we just relinquish, and this is something I I, I struggle with for a very long time, just because I was I was always an extremely anxious child. Like it, that was just my 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 poor nerd hypertrophy brain. <laughs> and so <laughs> even as an adult, it comes up for me. And Subhanallah, one of the most incredibly freeing things um, I've experienced, and this is something my husband reminds me, you know, as as well, is that you, we we it's almost like when we detach from the outcome and we say, yeah, Allah, take care of this for me. And we sincerely make dua and we have that niya. The outcome that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens for you is far beyond that which you could have ever anticipated. And there's something like, as soon as I see myself overthinking about things, I'm immediately like, let me just check out because not, this is uh, this is in Allah's hands. And just, you, you can never measure the impact of the things that you do because truly, there are certain factors that are metaphysical in nature that you can't measure. So as it, let's take this as an example. Let's say 100 people came, right? We're never going to get 100 people on a live. I wish, like I mentioned, most people watch the recordings. But I could look at them, see that as a reflection of how well we did or how well the advocate. But I never do because I literally, subhanAllah, even with the coaching and the people who I work with, I always think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought this person here because that is what they needed. And they brought them here as well because I needed that as well. And it's just a perfect combination of divine intervention and barakah. And you can't measure barakah. No one can measure barakah, right? SubhanAllah. So beautiful. May Allah bless your mother and the way she was able to take such complex principles of deen and, and put them uh, put them into practice in a way that a, a child could even learn. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Yeah. Mm. You mentioned that you like had a time where you really struggled. What happened? Because okay. girl, you, you, you're like this little bright little piece of sunshine on the internet. I'm sure you probably trigger a lot of people. Um, and not because you're doing anything wrong, but if he, I, I say this too. I get some crazy comments sometimes. And I just look at them and I'm like, subhanAllah, like may Allah give you the healing that you need because yeah. it's not, it's not, it's, you're not angry at me. There's a pain inside of you that's speaking yeah. and you don't know how to give it a, a voice yet. Yeah. What happened? So what happened is... How if you're it? comfortable sharing, by the way. No, yeah, no, yeah, no. no. I, I share this story frequently because I think it's important because my life at that point on paper looked very nice, but uh, internally it was complete chaos. <laughs> but what happened is that I ended up um, living on my own for the first... So I graduated from college and then I immediately went into my master's and mm -hmm. I got a job as a teacher if you know anything about teacher, first year as a teacher is just awful in and of its own. Like, I, I have three sisters yeah. who are teachers. Yeah. Two of them, two of them lost their jobs if, if you and went back to school to do something else. So that yeah. says a lot. So it was tough as a first year teacher and my first year in my master's. And I was living on my own for the first time. Um, and I just felt, and like, biologically that time is also a period of change so I noticed that a lot of the things that I absolutely loved and like built an identity around during my undergrad years like were no longer interesting at all and I was so confused I was like how did this passion of mine turn into something that was really annoying for me how was something as simple as laundry that I used to do like very easily suddenly become so hard for me like oh, yeah. why am I just changing so much and like no tools to help me <laughs> like not even a person mm -hmm. in the house to help me and it was just a very tough time in general to the point where I actually ended up quitting my job and I took all of my classes online for a semester and I moved back in with my family because it was I recognized that it was too hard for me to handle alone and mm -hmm. I basically said I have a support system I should go use it during this time mm -hmm. and so I quit my job I took my classes online moved back with my family for 
I think like three or four months. And at that point I was like, okay, now that I can catch my breath, now that my nervous system is like not, you know, is more regulated, is more calm, is more supported. I do not want to go back to what I was feeling before because like the time period was gone. I had to go back to my master's. I had to go back to work. And I was like, I have so many tools that I can use that I teach children, right? Like I teach children how to go through these internal changes, how to name their emotions, how to ask for help, how to um, regulate their nervous system. But I wasn't doing any of those things. And a big part of Montessori, Montessori, Maria Montessori, um, has written so many things about the transformation of the teacher and the things and the self care that you have to do as a teacher to Mm. be available for children. And that's like, I have all of this knowledge and I need to find out, I figure out a way to implement it, um, before I kind of transition back into that life so that I am better prepared. And that's what I did. I basically used all of the tools that I had learned during that time um, to do that little experiment that I was talking about. And alhamdulillah, since then, everything has been so much better and a lot more inner peace and calm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That must have been incredibly distressing for you, given the fact that you'd never experienced it before. And I mean, you you might remember you mentioned in one of your, um, Allah Masada Muhammad, your, uh, I think it was on TikTok before, it was on Instagram, that you'd never experienced trauma. And so it's funny because I think the first thing that came to mind is, yep, this girl was uh, got wrecked by that. That <laughs> at the very, at the very, I guess the the one benefit of trauma is it it prepares the heck out of you out of everything, <laughs> everything that could go wrong. Um, yeah. Obviously, I don't romanticize trauma by any means. So we, we do work to heal it, but that's one thing that I think a lot of individuals with trauma will say is that like. I was able to withstand a lot. And then there was one thing that broke me, but like I was getting punched over and over again. So that must have been really like rough. And I think for me, there was also a lot of self judgment that was happening subconsciously mm-hmm. where I was like, what is so hard about this? Like, it- mm-hmm. Like, what is hard? I couldn't pinpoint exactly what was, like, if you know something is wrong, you can at Mm -hmm. least say, okay, I'm experiencing this because of this event, or I'm going through all Mm -hmm. of these emotions because of this. But, like, everything seemed fine. So, Mm -hmm. So I was like, what is wrong with my situation for my body to be reacting like this, right? And for me to be having all of these internal changes. And I think for me, because my mom also instilled in me this idea that one, I have a support system and I can always ask for help. Two, that I do not have to push myself to the maximum. For her, I always saw her growing up that if something was overwhelming for her, she either eliminated it if possible, or reduced her load and so that was always an example for me growing up and that is honestly what gave me like i guess the courage that i needed to be like yeah okay i need to stop this for a while and and Mm -hmm. seek my support and go back to my family because i knew that i do not have to push myself to the max i don't have to push myself to the point of experiencing um you know something that it would be super hard for me to recover from do you know that what you experienced has a name uh quarter life crisis <laughs> no and like an actual name with that has research behind it, really? what it's, is it? Adjust, it's adjustment disorder oh. so it's, actually, it's actually a diagnos- diagnosable um technically mental disorder in, in that sense sorry i knew to throw it <laughs> <laughs> Good to but, know. <laughs> yeah it, because in i what I, I find that to be very validating because essentially what it affirms is that a lot of people actually experience this and adjustment disorder yeah. is specifically um kind of uh, psychiatric symptoms that come about whether it's extreme anxiety overwhelm um depression as a result of significant change in life so this might be a big move a new job a loss of um a partner or like well we're we're muslim so your husband in that case or a family member a friendship ending a um a divorce Uh, So all of these things can trigger adjustment disorder. And I think for for me, being a a medical provider and having training in in psychiatry, 
there was uh, some people are very minded like very uh, against labels but i always adore i love them because i was like then you kind of have something that encapsulates what's going on and yeah. here's and that means if we know what's going on we probably know the solutions to it exactly right? or somebody out there has identified solutions or yeah. we also can determine severity obviously anyone who's dealing with any mental health issues should always consult a professional first don't just try to white knuckle it <laughs> um otherwise you might do more harm than good but then we can determine severity and is like oh is this something i can like what you did create a program around um is this something that i can uh you know touch in with my medical provider and be like hey something's going on they'll be like let's check back in six weeks and see if things li just lift up yeah um, so yeah so it does it does have a name that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, subhanAllah. One thing I, I, I want to um, just like really, really highlight, and it's something that I also had to look, overachiever nation over here, right? That was like my cope, I mean, medicine, and I graduated with double honors and a major and a minor, and I think I took one semester off of school and I was doing community organizing and I was doing local and national speaking, and now I have a business. So overachiever nation. <laughs> Do you know what? I don't know why you're laughing at me like that. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> but subhanAllah, the, the one thing that I, I came a few years ago to the conclusion is the same thing that your mom said, which is if it's breaking me down, it's not worth it anymore like you i think when you're younger when i say younger i want to say like 25 and younger you're a lot more willing to push yourself to the edge because the, because the consequences to your body are not as obvious yeah right your nervous system is kind of modulating a lot more um but there's something that happens when you turn 26 i don't know what it and i know what it is but <laughs> when you turn 26 and your your essentially your hormonal health is not as robust as it once was and you're it just catches up with you and you realize oh the effects and the symptoms of me just pushing myself to the edge it, it i can feel it and it's no longer going to be something i can just sweep under the rug subhanallah so it's a big especially for women who we have extremely and this is something i talk about a lot it's, we have extremely sensitive um hormone cycles the menstrual cycle is not just this like thing that makes us bleed it controls it it, it i shouldn't say control it modulates your metabolism your mental health the your digestive system your bone growth your sleep um it is it's not just for reproduction subhanallah and it's i i, I know you posted something recently um about that as well but, talk about that. <laughs> huh? i was just gonna talk about that yeah oh, please go ahead yeah basically what my, i posted this on my story and i thought it was a really interesting conversation but you reminded me that our our periods really do affect so much our entire menstrual cycle affects so much of how we show up <laughs> that day for ourselves for our families um how our bodies are reacting to things right they may become more sensitive they may crave things more differently um mm -hmm. for me i have like very like i don't want to say weird but they really are weird indicators that my period is about to come so for example i have very very strong hunger and fullness cues alhamdulillah because i've been intuitive eating for about five years and mm -hmm. like three days before my period comes i feel nothing i do not feel hungry i do not feel full i could eat all day long or i could eat nothing mm -hmm. and i would be exactly the same and that signal by itself i'm like what is going on and then i'm like oh okay i think my period is coming and i check and it's true same thing with my um solo this is the wildest thing and i don't know how to explain it but i always forget my salah more often or I, I don't want to say that I forget it like not pray it at all but I just like it's as if I'm not praying but I'm still praying it's like mm. my body is preparing itself to not pray yeah but I'm still supposed to be praying and so I always catch myself like oh my goodness how did I forget ask I need to go pray it right now there's like 10 minutes left or oh my goodness how was I going to sleep before praying Aisha and turns out my period is going to be coming in three days and it's so so crazy and my story was about the fact that a lot of women don't recognize these patterns and don't mm. recognize these symptoms because their first assumption when they receive the signals is what is wrong with me when i'm eating so so much and i don't feel full the assumption is what is wrong with me when mm -hmm. i'm missing my salon more often or like i'm forgetting about it um my assumption is what is wrong with me and 
once you say that, like your your nervous system goes crazy, you have put yourself into shame and you really don't have access to that logical thinking anymore until you calm yourself down. And because it's such an automatic thought, it's such an automatic response, a lot of us don't even realize that our bodies have been put into freeze or that our logical brain has been turned off and we've been thrown into the emotional brain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so meeting a lot of those body signals with curiosity is essentially the purpose of kindness and mindfulness is learning how to focus about those symptoms, see the patterns in those signals, and then learn how to support your body through that phase. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Subhanallah. One thing, so uh, just uh, one thing I'm, I will push back on slightly just because there is a little bit of a difference in the way that some people just think. Is me Again, coming from the medical provider um, perspective, the immediate thought might be what's wrong with me, but sometimes it's not It's not a what's wrong with me that throws one into shame, but a wrong, what's wrong with me that actually is with curiosity. And I think one of the biggest issues is we have such horrific education on the female body. I mean, if you, so as you were talking, so this is something I, I just learned be, because of my medical education, but I don't think I would have learned otherwise. The forgetfulness is actually a very common psychiatric symptom of PMS. You are actually going to become more forgetful. Yes, girl, I'm a, I'm a hot, I, I just, <laughs> like, I just resolve myself to accept what's coming and like that the home is going to be a mess for the next several days. And <laughs> I will literally, subhanAllah, I will, uh, okay. I yeah, like- and the beautiful thing, sorry, mm-hmm. but the beautiful thing is that like I was able to notice that pattern and not judge myself for mm-hmm. doing that, even though that I didn't realize that it was actually a symptom of PMS. Yeah, yeah. And so it's really, it's it, it's with that education that we, we can, like you said, come to it with a lot more curiosity. And I always tell my, my, my especially my one-on-one clients, because things will come up and uh, <laughs> some of my group clients know this as well, that I'll get a message. So we will do our our live calls, and then we'll also I have a group chat, and so inter in between calls, if something comes up, they're able to reach out. Um, and anytime I see a distinct sharp like change, like you know I was doing well, but now I'm feeling more anxious. I was doing well, or maybe I was you know I feel like I was on the come up, but I have a dip in my mood. I'm like, how far? How 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 soon is your period about to come? <laughs> and they'll be like, it's in three days, or. Oh, I just checked the app and it says it's coming tomorrow. And I was like, okay, talk to me, talk to me in a few days, right? Not to, dis- but to say, s- stop looking for some, like you haven't, <laughs> so like looking for something as if you're not progressing. No, your, yeah. your body is just hitting the pause button because it has other things they need to worry about right now. And it's making the adjustment and your Allah has, it's a, when it comes to these things, we have to think as women, Allah has created our body resilient enough to be able to withstand it. He knew what he was doing. And even within, I mean, this is the wisdom of Islam, right? That even within the roles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for men and created for women is a reflection of our physiology and the way he created it. The fact that the provision role is on men and not on women in terms of finances there's something extremely merciful about that because men have a 24 for those who don't know 24 hour hormone cycle meaning they can just like you you guys have i'm sure you have people in your life you're like how do you have this much energy and like to withstand all this work and sometimes i'll look at my husband and like you know he's he's in nursing school right now and then he also works and i'm like i would be bawling on the way back <laughs> like crawling <laughs> through the door if i were you how do you do it with mashallah tabarakallah such like grace and positivity and then and then i'll have my week where i'm like yeah i can do anything and i'm great and i feel energetic and i wake up i'm like what are we gonna do to and then you just psych yourself out during that time because as soon as your hormones start to shift and your estrogen plummets and your testosterone plummets as well for those who wonder it's um uh, part of why you get that burst of motivation kind of right around your ovulation, not just because you're ovulating and your estrogen is, is, is or your your estrogen is coming coming up, but because your testosterone is actually coming up. Testosterone is a really good motivating hormone, <laughs> um, yeah. but when that plummets, so does everything else, including your motivation. And we talk a lot about like dopamine and um, the way dopamine modulates our motivation, not just our our mood and our joy, but subhanallah it's just it's a really beautiful thing to to think about say it inshallah any final words before i open up before i end the recording and then open up to questions 
Um, I think just a reminder that kindness really truly is powerful and this is always the message that I want to share regardless of what I'm doing is that kindness is not fluff like we talked about earlier even if the words sound so silly even if you're like okay is being respectful like really gonna change that much yes it changes so much in the way that you treat yourself in the way that you show up for your own actions in the way that you view the world right and so just a reminder that kindness is so so powerful and if you look anywhere in islam the the primary message that the prophet ﷺ shared with us is that rahma is is the way is the way to live life is the way to treat others and it's the way to treat yourself and allah solidifies that message as well in the quran beautiful Jazakallah khair. Let me stop the recording before anyone asks questions. And then for the ladies who have a question to ask, give me a thumbs up. Just hit a, hit the thumbs up button.